But with that, let's actually um, jump into responsive design. Okay. So the topics of responsive design we're going to hear today are, are things like media queries. We're going to uh, look at how to make images and fonts responsive and adaptive. And we're going to look at two specific layouts within uh, CSS. And one of them is Flexbox, which uh, if you've done the pre-reading, you've already seen. And the other one is, is uh, grid layouts. And what I want you to learn today is to differentiate between uh, all the options that you have to achieve those responsive layouts, to understand how both images and fonts can be made responsive, how to properly use uh, media queries to, to achieve responsive layouts, and understanding uh, when and how to use both Flexbox and Grids within layouts, and also understanding, and we're going to see that further, that those are not mutually exclusive, that you can use both of those things within one website also. But if you look at layout approaches, and what we mean by responsive design is it's a way to achieve uh, a layout for a website or application uh, that is responsive to different sizes of devices and to different modes of devices. Let's say you have a phone and you have landscape mode and, and the other mode. And there are different ways that people approach this. The more classical way, the way people started in the beginning, is by saying, I have some interface that works well on my computer or on larger screens, and I want to transition to an interface B that has a smaller screen real estate. And I'm going to make some tweaks on my site, or I'm going to deliver a completely different site for this different size. So that's what we call graceful degradation. And the other possibility, and I think this one is more and more considered nowadays because a lot of people uh, visit applications and websites from their phones is the mobile first approach where you start with a small screen real estate and progressively you introduce new styles and elements to be able to to offer a similar experience for larger interfaces and then we have response design at least that that's how uh, people in the paper I mentioned below, or the tutorial I mentioned below, um, define it, where you have, you go from both directions and say, I'm designing for all experiences. I'm looking at all the options I have, and I'm going to design uh, for all the screens, uh, and I'm going to start based on my content. And, and, and from the content, I will look at how can, I can uh, design in a way that is, it's responsive for all these different experiences. And if you read the article uh, that was in the pre-reading, the way that the, the metaphor that is being used in that article and being used by other people that work in the field as well is to, to let the content that we, we have fill the containers uh, that, the, that we have within, um, within our, our applications and websites. And instead of using very rig rigid pixel-based units, very, very absolute units, we should use relative units to specify the positions and size of our contents, the text and media. And these are some examples you, you see in the right here on how that could look like if we start filling the container with content uh, on different sized um, real est uh, screen real estates. And the techniques that, that are used to achieve that are the ones that I, I told you about in the beginning, things like media queries, things like uh, fluid, grid-based designs, um, responsive in images and font scaling. And those are the, the techniques we're going to talk about today. And media queries are an important and, and uh, widely used uh, rule you can use in CSS. So before uh, media rules or, or queries were introduced, we will, were only able to um, attach style information on a certain type of media. You could say, well, is this going to be printed? Is this a handheld? Is this a screen? And based on that, you could react in your style sheet. But with media queries, you can do a bit more. Uh, you can build complex queries using logical operations and to 
define what I'm currently styling. So if we look at the examples down below, if we say, for instance, uh, it always starts, the syntax is always add media. That's how the rules start. And then you have logical operators and, and, and different expressions you can use. So you can say, uh, for instance, media only screen. So this, and then, and then the scope, if you look at the scope to the right, everything, every ru a rule, every CSS rule you put in there only applies if, if those logical operators evaluate to true. And in this case, it means those rules will only apply if you're, if you're on, on a screen and if the width of your site is at most max width 500 pixels. And if you look down below, we, we have different possibilities of, of doing all that. For instance, the next one is, well, if it's a TV and it's at, mo uh, it's at least 700 pixels and the, and the orientation is landscape, then apply those styles. And you can al also use um, a logical or, and logical or is uh, um, similarly to regular CSS, is done with a comma. Oh, but I think for that to actually stick, let's look at an example. Let me see if there are any questions so far. Yeah, if you do have questions, please uh, let me know in the Tuvel chat. Maybe I've received e emails. Nope. Not so far. So if we go to media query here, so I, I've already prepared an example. I'm not going to build it from, from first principles. But let's actually first have a look at the example, and then we'll see what happens. So what I built is, is a very si uh, simple structure. Um, media query, yes. And if you look at the structure, the HTML structure here, it's, it's, it's really quite simple. We have a header with, um, with a heading. We have a navigation with, with some links in there. And we have a content with, with uh, just a list of, of, of animals. And then we have a footer where we have a copyright. So I would say a very classical, very standard, and very simple uh, website. And now, and this is the CSS I applied to it. So the CSS I applied is that um, I want to have the header be background uh, black, the same way as the footer, and I want the navigation to have a, a certain um, background. Now, what we will see now is as I make the viewport smaller, okay, the style will change. You see that? So, and, and it does that Im immediately. So every time you actually make the viewport smaller or larger, the C CSS will update the rules that it applies to, to the markup. Okay, so let's see what I did here. So if we go to the regular, by the way, here I already have one of the, the CSS properties we saw before. So I have a, a standard padding um, property or variable that I apply to, to both the header, the section, and, and the navigation. Right, so that's a standard padding I want to apply to a, a lot of the, the elements in my markup, so I define a variable. So that's just a quick aside. And then what I did is I defined background colors for the header, and I did some other very minor stylings here. And then this is the interesting part, so let's actually increase the size here. Right, let me see if... So what this does is, is uh, given that I'm on a screen, so I'm not on a, a braille reader or anything else, and up until the max width of 500 pixels. So this is what this means. So this is below 500 pixels. And if, as we increase this here, so this is the sweet spot. It's, it's very small, actually. See? So this is more than 500 pixels. This is less than 500 pixels. And what I do here is um, I, I just change the background colors of a lot of those, of the navigation and what else, I changed the, and maybe the content I think, right? Yes. So I changed background colors of navigation and the content. And I do one more thing with the navigation. If you look at the navigation here is I remove the, the bullet style. I make all the list items in line. What that means is that they're now 
in the, sa in the same line. They're not block elements. And I also add some, some pseudo classes, some pseudo elements here. So what I do is that um, instead of, so if I re remove this, let's say, okay, so this will be empty. What I did is that I'm inserting content between uh, the list elements. So what I do is that after every list element, I insert this pipe symbol here. And that's why it looks like this. Right. But if I don't have this rule here, then if I apply it to every list element, it will also be at the last element. So if I comment this out, then we also see it here, which is uh, a property of the style that I don't want. So what I can do is I add another rule, a pseudo, a pseudo class rule, that says at the, last at the last child, so this is the, the, pseudo, the first pseudo rule, that applies uh, on part of the, the DOM. And this applies to, to actually changing the, the, the DOM after. I add no content. So what this does is, is it overrides what I had here and applies, and applies this. That's why I don't have the content here. And this is how media queries uh, work. Right? Oh yeah, now, if I reset this to the same thing, we have the same thing. If I increase this, then obviously the pixel, pixels will also increase. So it will take longer to reach the 500 pixels. Okay, any questions on that so far? Let me reload Tuval, maybe. Oh yeah, oh, okay. So I, I need to reload Tuval, that's a, that's something I just learned <laughs> to see new messages. Okay, so, so we have one question by Johannes, which is, uh, what if there's no, que if, if no query is true, I assume? So that nothing is executed. Is there an else or a default path? Yeah, so the default paths is everything that you don't put within a media query. So everything that is here, a build, so that is not wrapped in anything, just in the style. That's just that's the default. And the other question was, yeah. So 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 if if this rule does not evaluate to true, then it will it will just never apply. Okay. And there's another question by Simon. That is. Is a rule inside a media query always more specific than a rule not defined in a media query, or are there exceptions? Um, I, I don't think that specificity is impacted by, by a rule being within a media query. What, what the, so the way you can imagine the media query is that every, every time, or let's say the CSS, I would imagine it this way as a metaphor. You can imagine the media query being pre-processed by CSS. So as soon as CSS, the browser loads the CSS, it looks at the media queries and it, it sees whether some of the media queries match the current state of the browser window. Okay? If that applies, then it just replaces things that, are, that uh, evaluate to true and just puts them into the standard style sheet uh, um, scope. And if it evaluates the false, it just drops them. It just removes them. Right? So I would say it doesn't impact the specificity uh, because it's, it's as if it's on the same level as, let's say, the default style element. As soon as it evaluates the true. Any other questions? And also... Simon and Johannes, I, I hope I answered your question. If not, let me know. All right. So if we go back to our slides here. So the next, next thing that uh, I want to talk about is something called the viewport, which is the vir virtual win window. Meaning that if you have uh, different absolute and, and relative measures, the way they're, they're in, interpreted is based on this thing called the viewport. It's the visible area of a web page, and it defines the, size, the virtual size content. And if you introduce it in a certain way, it can avoid things like horizontal scrolling, right? 
And if you look at the example that, that I took from um, developer documentation from Apple, uh, the left side you see is, is uh, without having this viewport and uh, setting a device width, and the right one is by setting it. And you can see the difference here, right? And the difference is that um, the, the way things are scaled on, on either the full page depend on this viewport. And you control this viewport by, by adding this meta element you can see on the, on the top here. It's not something you, you should worry too much about. It's just something that you, you should keep in mind that, that if something looks the way it looks on the left, then it's probably a viewport issue. Okay. Oh, this is an example of a media query, but we, we already saw one um, live. But you can see how such a media query might be used. Uh, just FYI, this example that, that I posted right here, if you just copy paste it into, into an HTML document, it will not fully work because there's some default CSS styles here uh, that have to do with flow that are, are not visible here. So what this example just want, wants to show is that if you use uh, a media query, you can adapt and change uh, certain things within, within CSS. So there's some relationship between media queries and what we call fluid layouts. And namely that media queries do not work well with fluid layouts. Because as you saw before, uh, things only change with a certain breakpoint. And this breakpoint is something you set. It's usually the, the pixel width. Okay. Oh, okay, there are two more questions. So there's a question by Conrad. What if two queries match for the same content? Um, so if, if two media queries match for the same content, they will be part of, of the, the CSS that is uh, displayed on that page. And then the specificity rules that I, I mentioned before will apply. Namely, you know, the number of IDs, the number of classes, uh, the number of elements within the rule, and then the order in the source code. So if, if it's all the same, it's the order in the source code. And there's another question by Michael. Uh, did you already answer it? Oh, so Michael answers, did you already answer the question about how to center an element vertically in CSS? I got into the stream just now. Uh, I will not answer the question right now because we're, we're going to get to, uh, we're going to get to layouts in a bit. But in layouts, you will see how to, how to center certain things. Uh, what I will also do, which I think is, is probably worthwhile, is I will just add a link to, an exa to examples on how to vertically uh, center things in CSS. I think that's going to be easier to actually have an example. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let me see. There is a question by... Rustam, I want to ask if it's possible to use this last child after utility to decline right margin of the last element so it's, it's met with the right border of the body. Um, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, so the way I, I've, so far I've seen uh, the pseudo class after being used is usually uh, by adding content because you can add margins and paddings on the element itself without it being on, a, on the pseudo element after. I, I think really what after uh, is, is um, directed to is actually targeting document object model elements that are after certain elements. So, so I'm pretty sure that applying a margin to the after would not have an effect, but it's something you can try. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions. Okay, none so far. So going back to this particular slide, so if we have media queries, we have breakpoints. So that's not the, so, so what you saw before is that, that it snaps in those breakpoints. And if you wanna have a fluid layout, then 
what people do is they use different modes of, of styling, different, different layout modes, and they use relative measures uh, to do certain things. Okay. And one of the things you need for that is fluid images. And images, interestingly, are fluid by nature. So if you apply a certain uh, width to an element that, that is relative, then the browser will scale it for you. So the, the browser is pretty powerful, and it, it has its own algorithms to scale the image for you. The, the downside to the letting your browser do that is that if you have a very large image, but you actually need a very small one that is not the, not the size that, that you want to, then you are going to transport your image over the network layer uh, regardless, right? So it's not like you, you, if you say in CSS you want, only want to have 50% of an image, that it will request only 50% of that image from the server. That's not how it works, unfortunately. So in order to, to, to deal with this, um, HTML and CSS have, have a particular way of defining what kind of image you want from the server. So, and, and that deals with different screen sizes and different screen real estates. So if you use this picture element, you ha can, can apply different sources. You can say, well, there's a picture I have on the server that is for mobile, there's one for the tablet, and you know my default backup is the biggest one for the desktop. Right? And here you can also apply media queries. Let's say the mobile one only applies if I have uh, a max width until 720 pixels, uh, the, the tablet one with 1280, and then the default is a desktop. Um, and then the last one is what you usually do if the user agent does not support the picture element, right? So it doesn't know wh what to do with it. You still have the, the original image thing um, that you can apply here. And it's similar with, with, um, with fonts. So, so with fonts, so, so pi pixels, I think, are OK to use for for things like uh, containers. So if you s wanna size a container in a certain way, I think pixel is an okay way of doing that. If it comes to fonts, uh, the best way of defining fonts is relative to, to, um, relative to the viewport. Meaning that, and th this is, a, and you can also adapt it to d different screen sizes by having media queries and, and increasing or decreasing the the, even the relative measures of the fonts, but usually that's not particularly, um, let's say, encouraged because you should st you should design in a certain way that that the relative measures of the font uh, play well with the viewport of the smaller or the larger devices and screen real estate. So don't use pixels for fonts uh, specifically because pixels stay the same. If you have 12, 12 pixels on, and, and, and they depend on the, on the screen resolution. So 12 pixels on my computer that has a very high resolution will not be, this, be the same as 12 pixels on another computer that has a lower resolution, right? So even if you're staying within the same device, uh, pixels might not give you the same experience. So usually, uh, if you style fonts, avoid pixels. Let's see if I have any questions so far. Okay, great. So yeah, these things are, uh, both images and, and fonts, I think, are not uh, very difficult to deal with. It's just something that you just have to keep in mind. So the, the image is just part, is, is just a performance optimization. So you, get, you can always use the largest image you can get from the server and then just let the browser resize it. But if you, if you are um, on a mobile network and you're, you're loading a three megabyte image to that mobile network, it's not gonna be uh, what you actually want. You can uh, introduce a slow performance. And with fonts, um, what you want is relative measures because you, you want users with different devices and, and, um, and resolutions to have good experiences. Okay, there's one question. Okay, there's one question by, by Gary. So the question is that, um, there was a misunderstanding on the image not being supportive in the user agent. Does it mean that the tag is used? Okay, uh, no, so, so what I meant with the uh, IMG here is that some older browsers uh, do not support the picture element. So, 
uh, I, I will show I'll, I'll show this to you uh, later on. But there's a website that shows you what kind of browsers support support what kind of elements, and if an older browser does not support the picture element, it's kind of customary to add this IMG tag as a fallback. And the picture tag knows about this and, and uh, allows you to have it in there, although it doesn't have any effect if picture works. If picture doesn't work, then the older browser will just use IMG. So it will still give you the image. Hope that answers your question. Oh, there's another question. All right, so this is not a great experience here on my phone. Okay, so that there's a question by Anna Victoria. I heard that CSX pixels do not equal to device pixels. Can you explain whether this is true and how they differ? Uh, yes, there's a difference, and I, I just recently read about it. I, I just don't feel comfortable right now uh, giving you half knowledge. So let me, let me write this down and get back to you on that, okay? But good question, thank you. Great. Okay, so now we uh, get to a bit more interesting things, uh, namely CSS layout modes. So in order to to build an interesting and good CSS um, layout, there are different uh, modes you can use for that. So the first two I mentioned here, uh, block and inline, are, are layout modes that, that we've already seen. Right? A block element is an element that takes up the full width of a, of a site or um, of the parent element. An inline element, and you can, you can um, to the block element, you can, you can add width and height. So you can do a lot of things with that. Then we have inline elements that take up as much space as they need. So they take up as much space as the content that is within the inline element uh, needs to take. There's actually one in between um, layout that I, we haven't mentioned that. It's the inline block that has properties of both the block and the inline. Um, that's maybe something you can look up on your own. Then we have uh, tables that we've seen before. Um, in the early, to, like late 90s, early 2000s, tables were actually used to, to build layouts in the way that grid and, and flexbox are used today. And then we have position layouts, meaning that you can position uh, elements on the site arbitrarily. And those are usually used for animations or, or um, let's say for, if you have a, a dialog box and you want to have uh, a close button, then uh, position elements are, are used to put the, the close button to the right top, right? And then what we're going to talk about today in more detail are things like uh, f flexible and grid layouts. Okay. Oh, and this is actually uh, the website I was talking about before. Let's uh, let's open this. Oops. Oh, great! I have no Wi-Fi, obviously. So, can I use is dot com is this website where uh, you can say, well, can I use picture? And it will tell you um, which versions of browsers support or do not support this element. So in the older versions of, of Chrome, for instance, uh, there's no support for this element. And if you look at the, at the newest browsers, that uh, most of them ha do have uh, support for it, um, except Internet Explorer. But, you know, what can you do? Let's see. Okay, so if we... Oh, there's, one, there's a question here. Come on. I'm, I'm struggling with the, my phone sometimes because it doesn't open my chat box, so I apologize for that. Okay. No questions so far. Uh, so we're going to talk about Flexbox, and for those of you who have done the pre-reading slash pre-doing uh, with Flexbox Froggy, you know what I'm talking about. Flexbox is um, this layout mode that enables you to align and distribute elements within a container. 
And the way that it works is that it is content centric, meaning that you have uh, semantically defined content in a linear way. And then it, what it does is it tries to distribute and align these elements that flow in a certain way in the document uh, such that uh, it, it aligns in one dimension, either on the row dimension or on the column dimension. And I think, so, so, so this image here gives you a few uh, basic terms that are being used within uh, the Flexbox. But I think the, the easiest way to, to actually understand what, what the Flexbox does and, and how it works is number one, practicing it. So do go to, do, if you haven't done it yet, do go to Flexbox Froggy, this website that I pointed to in the pre-reading, and go through the different levels. I think it was 24. And also, uh, I think, oh yeah, let's get to the other slide. So if, if you look at the slide here, then there are different properties you can use. So you have properties that apply on the containers, and you have properties that apply on the items. And both, uh, both on the items and on the con container, uh, you define how certain things are, uh, how the elements are aligned um, based on, on the flow of the elements. So if you, if you look at the example here, um, you, it, this is the same markup, but, but using different properties of Flexbox. So I think the easiest way to, to illustrate that is by actually showing you a live example. Okay, so I have prepared a Flexbox Live thingy here. Let's see if there are any questions so far though. Okay, none so far. So, so let's look at the example that we're gonna use is, is actually very similar, yes. This is a Flexbox Live example. So here, it's, it's, a, it's very similar uh, from the example we had before, but if you look at the CSS, we removed uh, the media query completely, and now we only have uh, this structure, and we added some more elements here. So here in the, uh, in the section with the ID content, we've added a couple of animals that we want to style, style in a certain way, okay? So in order for us to, to illustrate that a little bit, let's actually go uh, somewhere to the top here. Uh, where is the content? Oh yeah, so the section style here. It doesn't matter. So what I wanna do first is, I would just wanna style, I just wanna say, well this have a width of 100 pixels and let's say a height of 40 pixels. And in order for us to see any of that, we're gonna add a border. One pixel, um, solid, and black. Okay, so if we apply that, then we can see that the way that the elements flow is, uh, obviously they're block elements, they have certain width and height, and uh, because they're block elements, they, they, are, they, they, they take up the, the full line. So the next element will be on the, on the next line. But in, if, if we want to now have a more, um, let's say, flowing way of, let's make this larger a little bit. If we want to uh, let this, uh, this content flow a bit better and have them next to each other, for instance, we're going to add this property uh, on the container called flex. Let me see if there are any questions so far. Nope, okay. Okay, so on the content, what we'll do is we'll add display flex. Okay, and what that will do is that every, uh, the, the container itself is now flex, and every item in, in, every element in the container is a flex item. And what we can do also here is we can have different directions that this flows to. So there's a property called flex direction, and there are certain so let's say we wanna use a row here. Let's see how that looks like now, okay? And now everything aligns in a row. Yeah, and, and as we close this up, it, it, it tries to, to still align everything in rows. If you, if you want to handle this a bit better, 
there's another element um, property we can use, which is called uh, flex wrap. Okay, and if you wrap things up, then it will actually wrap to the next row. So in in full size, it's going to be like this. But as we close this up, it's going to if you see a wrap, it's going to still apply the the width and the height that we we gave it, and we'll fill things out the way we want it. And now there there are different ways for us. See, so I think that's pretty interesting. And that already, without having any media queries, allows us to design layouts in a certain way. And let's apply so, some more interesting properties here. So let's say, let's say we want to uh, space out the elements. So we can say justify content. And we have different options here. Uh, there's flex start, for instance, which I think is the standard. Right. So, but if we say justify content, um, let's say space around, then if we just make it a bit, yeah, you, you can see how, how this changes the way the layout is being rendered. And in the same way, if we do the same thing, but not have space around, but space between, then it will evenly space the items between themselves, see? And we'll try to align them with the, the left and the right end endings. Let's see what else we might have here. And then we can apply certain things to the items themselves. We can say um, align items. Oh, let's start with content. Um, or let's say align items. And then we say stretch. Um, right. So if we say stretch, then it will, it will, you can see a little bit here, right? How the stretching property behaves. And then let's add one more thing to the, let's make a line content. And let's align it to center. I think that's more interesting if we have less. So let's let's remove some of the. Oh wait, now a line goes from the bottom. Um, so let's add at a height. Let's say we want to have a height of 800 pixels. Okay. Now if we remove a line content, this will be. This is the the difference in a line. So a, a line refers to, to vertical alignment and justify refers to horizontal alignment. Okay, make it a bit smaller. There you go. So let's see if we have any questions on that so far. There are two questions. Bear with me as I try to open them. There we are. Uh, there's another question by, by Michael. Can you use flex wrap with keeping the same number of elements uh, for each row? Um, no. I'm trying to think. So, so there are certain ways you can force certain elements to be in certain positions, even in, in Flexbox. So we're going to go in the slides. We have an example of that here. So if we, if we want to achieve a certain layout, let's say the top one here, then there's a, a property called order. And, and with this order, given a, a finite set of elements, you can enforce certain orderings in the Flexbox. But in general, uh, with Flexbox, I can say I want to have n elements in the columns and n elements in the rows. And that's one of the limitations we have in, in Flexbox, uh, namely that it gives us the ab ability um, to, to flow things in a certain way, right? So it's, it's very content-centric in, in that way. 
but what it doesn't give us is the ability to control every aspect of the layout. And the layout that does that is the next one we're going to look at, it's grid. So if you go, I'm going to go to grid, it's going to give us that property to control uh, how many elements there are for each row, for instance. And there's another question by, by Rustam. Um, is there any solution to have space only, bet only between items, not touching borders? Uh, if I don't want to use different margins, like justify content space between, but with an exact amount of pixels. I see. Um, well, for that, you can just use the margin on the elements themselves, right? So if, if you want a certain a specific am amount of, of margin, you just say margin, uh, let's say margin, whatever, all around of six pixels, right? And then you, you'll int you introduce that margin in there. Not sure if that answers your question. So m maybe your, your question is maybe uh, a bit more involved than that. But if it is, let me know. Not sure if I can answer it within the lecture, but, but uh, if you give me an example, I will try to, to answer it in the, in the forum. OK, is it another question? So a question by Andre. Will you put your example code up for download? Um, I can, sure. Um, yes. I can put all the code that I, I put here up on the website. And uh, Michael has a clarification on his question on, on defining elements per row. Uh, and the, he has an example. I have 10 elements in a row, and when I make the screen smaller, it will only split for uh, five and five and not for seven three for example I see I don't think that you can con you can control this specific instances with flexbox I'm, uh, honestly I'm, I'm not an expert in, in flexbox um, but thinking through all the properties that it offers you I don't think you can do that in flexbox but you can, what you can definitely do that in is in in grid so grid has a, a more rigid model of how it it um, it spaces out the content within in your layout. And you, you can definitely say only split 5.5 five and not 7.3 there. Okay. Okay, so, so there's one more question, but before I get to that, let me just quickly also give some examples on, on how, what properties you can apply to the actual elements. So let's say we are here and um, there's a element called the line self and it has all different sorts of different sorts of properties and let's, let's see what they do, right? So if we stretch here, can't see much of a difference here, but we see a difference here, right? We see a different difference in how the elements as, as we progress in, in making width, width larger and smaller um, change. And if we change that to center, for instance, it's also, okay, it's also a bit different. Um, oh yeah, line is always this, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if we have a, a fixed width, then larger. Let's actually go back to 400. And there's, I think, one more that I wanted to show you here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. It's uh, the justify self. Right, and that changes the way that uh, centering is being applied to all these elements, right? If you look at this. Okay, so let's have a look at the questions again before we move on.
So Soleiman has a question that says, is there a way to set a horizontal padding between each item and vertical padding between each item? So, so if you want to set specific pa paddings, in the, then, then just apply them to the items, right? You can just say padding, um, let's see, you say padding, you say padding 20 pixels and 40 pixels, right? Then it would look something like this. Not sure if you meant paddings or margins, but if you want to apply specific um, paddings or margins, then you have to do them on the items themselves. That's not something that Flexbox is designed for. Okay. So let's move on then. So if, you, if you've played around with um, the pre-doing pre slash pre-reading, you've seen how the, these orderings work. Um, they're not as predictable statically as, as they may look here, especially if you have more elements. And if you have, let's say, uh, a reverse ordering of uh, like a, a, a column reverse order. But so if you want to like get a, get a better feeling how, of how these orderings work, then I would definitely urge you to try it out. So, and with that, I'm going to move on to grids. And I see uh, no questions so far. So I, I assume we're good with the Flexbox. If you do have any other confusions or questions on the Flexbox, um, let me know either now or in the forum later. So the grid is a different way of layouting uh, certain things within, within your uh, elements in HTML. And grid en enables you to have more control on the sizing and positioning of the elements. So if Flexbox uh, gave you a way of, of defining how things should wrap and, and um, you know, how things, how things should flow and how things should be aligned, then what Grid does is it allows you similar things that Flex does, but with a lot more control. Um, and there's certain terms within uh, the Grid layout that are important. The Grid line defines um, the lines that you have here. And if you look at a grid, you can also you know, look at it as, as a table. You can look at it as a, as a matrix. And it, it has columns and rows. Um, where, as I, I, here, we can, we can actually see all the columns and, and rows. Whereas in Flexbox, there was sort of a, like an, an attempt to, to have things flow in this way. But here, we actually have things we can, we can talk about in this way. So if we have a grid cell, then it's a particular row and column. If we have a grid track, then it's either a particular column or a row. If you have a grid area, then it's an adjacent uh, set of cells that form a rectangle. All right? And we can target any of those things within CSS if we use a grid layout. Okay? So just a quick example of how this looks like. You say display grid. And then you can say things like grid template rows or get grid template columns. And what this does is in the, in the top element, in the, in the parent element, it just says, how does my grid look like? And in this case, what, what we say in the first example is we are defining a grid with two rows and three columns of a certain size. And what you, what you can also do is you can assign names to those different columns and rows uh, if you want to um, target them later in the CSS. So that's the second example we see on, on the bottom. And you can also see how the particular two row, three column example looks like um, um, visualized on the right side here. And now we can do uh, many different things uh, in, the, in the child elements. So what we saw here is what we, we are defining within uh, the parent and in the child. Uh, we can specifically target certain things. So we can place the child in a certain way. So if we want to place the child in a certain grid cell, um, we say grid row and grid column. We can say grid, grid row three and grid column three, then it will be the, uh, and grid column two, sorry, and it will be the, in the position that the, the pink element is on in the right example. What we can also do is we can define a span 
we can say, I want to have uh, everything from row 2 to 5, and I want to have the column from 3 spanning 2. And that's the, the turquoise example we see on the right here. So we have a lot of control where we're going to place our items within the grid. Let's see if we have any questions so far. OK, so far we're good. So let's move on a little bit. And, and here we also have a lot of horizontal and vertical alignment support. Right? So this is not necessarily what the question was before, because I, I think that was in, uh, uh, in a more general sense. But if it comes to layout and, and you want to align something in a certain, a certain way, then the grid gives you most control on, on, on how to do that. So if, if you download the slides, you can see all these examples. Um, if, you, if you don't see the examples here, then I've actually, th it's a link down below here. So there's a really good blog post on this that I, I used to design those slides that explains in, in a lot of detail. And I will add this link also to the website. But you, you can also find it on the slides on, on the definitions on how the grid works. And it's, it's not super complex. I think it's a, a very straightforward for me metaphor because I think we're, we're actually used to uh, dealing with tables. Um, since we, you know, uh, it's, a, it's something that we, we've been exposed to as a user interface for, for a while. So if you look at that, then you can see that you can apply uh, a line and justifies to the items themselves to stretch them out within the grid. Uh, you can also uh, align the con and justify the content within um, the parent element in the grid. So it looks like that. So you have all sorts of different methods um, to work with the grid to very specifically tell where items should go. Right? And now there's, there's one interesting thing also. Uh, it's another unit that has been introduced within the grid. So uh, if you remember from before here, we just use pixels. And you can do that. If you want to have very specific um, widths for certain things, you can use pixels. But then what the grid has introduced is this unit called the fraction, FR. And one fraction, one FR, is one part of the available space that we have in the current viewport. And if you look at, at, at the few examples I put, I put here, uh, you can mix and match uh, different relative and absolute units here. Uh, fraction and percent being relative units, for instance, and, and pixel being an absolute unit. Now, you might ask yourself, why would I mix uh, in absolute units? Well, sometimes you, you might need to have uh, a very concrete um, width or height within an element. Let's say if you're displaying an ad or you're displaying, you're displaying uh, some info box that has to be a certain size. But then the other elements w within that grid, for instance, can flow around this depending on the window size. And that's the second example, uh, what the second example shows. And the third example is also interesting be because uh, we can also use multiples of fractions. And what that means is, is that um, it just takes two columns in this case, right? Uh, we have one fra the, first, the first column has one fraction, the, the second column is one fraction, and then, then the fourth column actually takes up the size of the second and first column. So it's a, it's a relative measure within the grid. Okay, before we move on, let's also go through a live example of the grid that I've prepared. Um, let's close this, close this, this too. Yes, there you go. Okay, so here we have uh, the same elements we had before, right? We have those divs, and there's no styling whatsoever. Let me quickly check if there are any questions. All right, no questions so far. So let's go through the grid system and see how that works out. So here we have already started. I, I added a display.grid. That's, the, that's how it starts. And now we have all sorts of different methods. So, and then again, just to remind you, we, we added a specific width and height uh, to the content. So here, what we can start with is just saying, well, I want to have a, a template for 
for my columns. And let's see, I just want to have them 200 pixels and 200 pixels. So what's going to happen here? So maybe take a few seconds to think how this layout, let's make it a bit larger, right? how this layout will look like with this rule. So what do you expect? Okay, so quick thinking. All right, it just defines two columns. So whatever content you have and whatever way it flowed before, I'm enforcing that I want to have two columns of that. Right? So let's have, let's say I want to have six columns. But, you know, I don't want to just type in six things. So there's a convenience uh, method here that says repeat. I can say I want to repeat the 200 pixels, let's say, let's say four times. Right? That's what it does. Just adds four columns, each column having, having uh, 200 pixels. Um, let's try some justify things. Let's uh, justify um, items. What options do we have? Or justify. Wait, let's see. Right. So then this changes how, how the items are, are centered horizontally. We space it around, but we can also say um, space, what else was it? Uh, I don't think it was space between, right. So if we do that, then it behaves differently. Right? But the, the thing here is that if you remember Flexbox, as soon as we went uh, smaller than, than what we defined in the items, 100 pixels and 50 pixels, it tried to accommodate. It tried to, to um, shrink the content in the way that it still would work for the window size. So what grit does is it doesn't compromise. If you say you want to have 100 pixels in width, it will keep 100 pixels in width. Right? Uh, let's say we have a min width here. So that's a bit different then, probably. Yeah. So if, if you define a min width, then that's different. Okay. So I would say grid is, is a bit more is a bit more um, rigid in uh, it's doing what you want it to do. Now let's see if we have questions in the meantime. There's one question. Can I say repeat four width divided by four? Um, I think what you want to have is a fraction here. So, what, so what, um, what Michael is asking is, can I do something like this? I want to repeat four times and I want to have the width, or whatever the width is, divided by four. So uh, this is not valid CSS syntax, right? So if you go here, yeah, this will not work. Just, uh, it will parse to nothing. Um, what this equals to, I mean, if I interpret this correctly, is you want to have, you want to repeat one fraction four times. Okay? And then it just parses out to whatever the size of the window is. And that's a fraction, the relative fraction unit I talked about before. I hope that answers your question. Okay, then another question. In the meantime, I can also do other things. Uh, let's say eight. Okay. So it tries to do eight things. It tries to do eight columns, right? So it, it does whatever you want it to do. And as you see here, this is, this is whatever I, I define here as my, my dimensions, it would always stay in this grid system. If you remember the flex box, it, it tried to, to even out the content depending on how I wanted to justify it. Whereas here, I rigidly said, I want to have, in this case, eight columns. You'll do it in eight columns. Um, let's actually do this, let's say four here. But let's add a grid template uh, rows. And let's say I want to have, uh, or I want to just have two, two rows. Let's see how it deals with that. 
Okay. So in this case, well, in this case, it has to do with three rows because we, we don't have, but it, it continues to take over the, the properties of the last row. And if we, and you see here, if it's below 200 pixels, it will just, it will just hide the content. It will, it will force the 200, pix 200 pixels on you. Um, if we say one fraction, though, like if we say one fraction, one fraction, right, then it will go with the flow. It will still have the height here, but let's say we have a 20 pixel height, right? Um, let's do a repeat. That's Oh, okay, I, I do have to define, um, let's say, at least two columns. Oh, wait, I made a mistake somewhere. Oh, columns. There you go. Uh, I would have thought that it's gonna, I'm gonna align. Space around. No. All right. For some for some reason, I expected this to also uh, try to adjust um, the other size, but it doesn't do that. Oh, probably because I haven't. All right. And min height. There you go. That's what I expected to do at least for the first couple of rows that I have to find, right? So if I say six, then it does it for all the rows. Okay, there was one question that I don't wanna ignore. There are three questions now. I added more confusion than I helped probably. Let me see. <laughs> uh, Solomon is asking, can I always use flex instead of grid? I, I mean, Flex versus grid, there's a slide I have on that, but, but in general, it depends on, on, on how, you wanna, how you want your content to, to react for, on different sizes of, of the viewport. There's not either or. Um, and there, there are certain situations that, that you can model in grid that you can in flex. Uh, I think most situations you can model in flex, you can also model in grid, but not all of them. So th there are certain situations that you can that you can model in only one of the two. Um, there's a, a question by Malcolm. What would happen if you combine fractions and fixed values? Um, yeah, let's have a look at that. That's a good question. So if you combine fractions and fixed fixed values, it will. Okay. Um, let's say we want to have. The first column should be always, what's our, what's our width here? 100 pixels. Should always be 150 pixels, right? And then we have one fraction, one fraction. Oh, that's a rows. I want to have that in columns. Let's remove the rows for now. Okay. And let's also remove these here for now. So you can see that for the rest of the items, it just aligned them uh, based on the relative unit that I put. And the first column here stays in within the defined 150 pixels. Right? While these other things just, just scale with whatever I have in terms of my viewport, the one item just stays the same. Okay, hope that answers the question. Um, there is a question by Florian. How is the fraction different from using VH or VW to get the viewport size? Um, I haven't actually um, experimented with that at all, quite frankly. Um, ad hoc, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I could look into it though. So if, 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 it's, the, if it's an important question for you, uh, post it in the forum and we will look into that. Um, 
for now, just just um, Fraction was introduced to work with grids and to be able to to you know relatively um, size up with with different sorts of of mix matches of absolute and relative values within those properties. Um, whether you know the viewport relative measures would also work potentially, uh, I haven't tested it though. Okay, I think we're through with the questions so far. Yes, okay. I think there was, there were a few things I still wanted to show you. Oh yeah, there's one more thing that uh, I think is, is quite interesting. And if you, you don't want to have a fixed you know, column size, and you just w want it to, to wrap around kind of, th in the similar way that Flexbox uh, does it, uh, there's this property for columns. Let's see here. Um, what you can do is you can say repeat, and then you say auto fit, right? And then um, there's also this, this function called minmax that, you know, can compare between uh, absolute and relative measures. So I can say, well, the min that I want to have, in this case, this is 100 pixels. By the way, this is already a, a good candidate for introducing a variable because we're, we're meaning the same thing here, right? So we could potentially say... Um, Item width, right? And here we can say bar item width or 100 pixels. Uh, what am I missing here? Here. And here also I can say bar item width. But that just as, as an aside. Okay, but here we have this thing called repeats, but we don't repeat a, a specific number of columns. We just auto fit it based on the viewport we have currently. And, oh, wait, so we don't want to have that. So instead of 100 pixels here, we want to have one fraction. So it either, either gives you uh, this minimum width that I defined here, right, or the fraction here. So let's have a look. See? And now it, it sort of uh, reacts in a similar way uh, that Flexbooks would. Okay? So this is also an interesting way of, of building responsive designs uh, using this auto-fit uh, measure. There's also an auto-fill measure, I think. Uh, let me see what it did. But I think in our case, it doesn't make much of a difference. All right. So there's auto-fill and uh, auto-fit um, there is a, we can just Google it, right? You know, sometimes I also have to Google stuff. Autofill and autofit uh, grid. And see, there's always, <laughs> there's always a, a YouTube video that explains things. Uh, this is, by the way, a really, really good site that, that hosts blogs by different people that work on CSS. And in this case, they, exp they will probably explain the difference between autofit and autofill. And in both cases, it has to do with wrapping, right? So autofill fills a row with as many columns as it can see fit, and autofit fits the currently available columns into the space by expanding them. I see. Okay. So, you know. Similar semantics, but, but with, with, so it, they both achieve wrapping, but um, in the way they fill the content over the viewport, uh, they behave a bit differently. And I think that's the last thing I actually wanted to show you in terms of grid. There are a lot more things you can do with grid. So um, let's maybe actually um, try out uh, one more thing in terms of justify. Let's say justify self here. And I say center. What's going to happen here? Oop. Mm, 
Let's have a different. Okay, so. Oh, wow. Well. See that wrapping doesn't occur at all now that we remove the, the auto fit? And let's see how the justifying de behaves differently if we remove that. See? Okay. So that just defines on how we use those 200 pixels. So we here define that we want to have three columns with 200 pixels. If we introduce this justify self center, then it's going to center the, the defined item width here, which is 100 pixels, within the 200 pixels. If we don't use that, the, the default is to stretch it out. And, and there, there are many different other kind of things to, to adjust and to uh, align uh, those different items within th this grid. I would say, I would suggest for you to have a look at the different options, try them out, and see what fits. Uh, what I can tell you is that in the assignment that you're going to use, you're going to use not only the grid and not only Flexbox, it's going to be a mix of, of, of both of them, uh, depending on what you need within the single page, or even, um, I mean, between different pages or within the single page, right? So grid doesn't mean that it applies to the whole page or Flexbox. It means that it applies to a parent element, and you can organize your content within the parent. Within the parent. So let me see if there are any questions. There are two questions. So Florian. Oh, okay, so Florian just, just said that he was just curious with the viewport relative measures. Uh, then I have a question by Daniel. Uh, two questions, actually. Um, okay, so, so that is a, a meta question of a, if there's any further information about assignment one. Um, so assignment one is already published now. So as far as, as um, I'm aware of it, so because Michael Schroeder is, is uh, in, in charge of um, assignment one mostly, or the assignments in, in general, that uh, the groups are now fixed. So everyone uh, has a fixed group now. You have to uh, sign up for uh, the GitHub repo to be cloned with, with your team. And then you get the template for assignment one. And within the template for assignment one in the README, uh, that is the, the assignment description. And that, that's also the second question. Um, you, ha you have to sign up for the repository, but a lot of people already uh, did that. So uh, maybe just ask, maybe if you, if you can find how to do that, maybe ask the question in the forum and other people can help you with that. So I want to, how much do we have left here? I think that's actually my last slide, yes. So I want to close with, with a, what I've already uh, sort of said before, um, namely what, what are the difference, differences between Flexbox and Grid, and um, can I use both, or should I use just one? And the latter part I already answered, um, especially in your assignments. There are examples where you, you'll have to use both, even on one page, uh, or you can. Um, we did in our, in, in when we uh, designed the assignment, you don't have to. It d really depends on, on how you want to um, do the layout. But the theoretical difference between the two is often characterized uh, as one-dimensional versus two-dimensional layouts. So. In Flexbox, you can only control what happens in one dimension. You can say you want to you um, align towards columns, you want to align towards, or, or you want to align towards uh, rows, um, and you want to justify or, or align in certain ways, right? And so the way you, you can think of that is it's a, it's a, it's a content-first approach. You define your content, and based on that content, um, you adapt how, how um, the layout reacts to different window sizes, right? And it's more children specific, so the, the children have properties that have more control or, or on where they end up with. So a child can say, I want to have the order X, or, or I want to be justified in a certain way. So 
uh, certain specificities within the layout are more defined by the children than, than they're defined by the parent. On the other hand, in the grid, the grid can, can uh, align layouts both based on two dimensions, namely uh, the row and the column dimension. It's a more rigid um, layouting mechanism. It's uh, very specific to what you have in mind for the children to be placed in. And the nice thing is that you, ha you have a lot of declarative control uh, where elements should end up. Right? So the parent, as we saw before, can say, I want to have this amount of columns, th this amount of rows, and I, I want things to look a certain way. And whatever the children do, they, they do, but I want, I want to have this particular layout that I have in mind. So one quick example, so, so if you look at this wrapper over here with elements one to five, and we look at, at this uh, flex box here, um, this is how it would look like, and if you look at a very similar thing we do in, in grid, then we, you see the difference here, right? You see the difference in rigidity that we define uh, within, within those things. Obviously, well, you, you, you can make grid look the same way Flexbox does, but Flexbox does that naturally because of the way it wants to wrap things uh, within a certain layout. And again, just last time saying it, um, layout modes are not defined for an entire page. You define the layout mode the way you see it fit. You can mix and match however you need and want to.